Uh, vamos a seguir con esta segunda mesa del Deciding Fest. Uh, es una mesa que nos hace especial ilusión porque uh, se va a la raíz de uno de los uh, problemas principales que tenemos uh, en el mundo de las tecnologías democráticas y del software libre que tiene que ver con, con su sostenibilidad y con su gobernanza. Tenemos esta, esta mesa llamada Sostenibilidad para el futuro de las tecnologías democráticas y contamos con Andrea Grow de la Sovereign Tech Fan y también con Malcolm Bain, que es abogado especialista en derechos digitales y, y software libre. Y vamos a tener esta conversación y también hoy contamos uh, con una, invitados de lujo especiales en la fila cero, que es Madis, del proyecto Madix y activista del software libre, y también a uh, Pedro de, de, de la Xarxa de Radios Comunitarios de Barcelona, de Gifinet, Exo y también de la OPC. Uh, muchas gracias por estar aquí uh, y nada, arrancamos el debate. Uh, thank you very much, Arnaud. That will give him a clap. Come on, he's the boss. Um, <clears throat> this, this table will be in English. Bon, bon dia a tothom. Uh, we can do it in, in local language as well, but uh, because Adriana is here from Germany, we'll, we'll be speaking in English. And we'll try not to speak too fast so the translators can keep up with us. Um, so, um, just to position the debate, we're now in kind of like year 40 of open source and free software. Uh, so, and, and it's uh, obviously the, the number itself proves that free software can be sustainable, but not everything is sustainable. And I think one of the biggest debates we've seen um, since 2000, 2005 is, is how to keep uh, marginal. And, and I think the CDM is still marginal when you compare it with the huge projects like Linux or Mozilla or whatever. How do you keep um, niche and, and uh, but essential democratic technologies, free software technologies, uh, sustainable, keep them going? Um, as as uh, Mark was saying this morning, Barcelona uh, led the Decidim project, financing its beginning, uh, getting support from other cities. Uh, and that's a, that's a specific model for public, um, uh, you know, GovTech, uh, as, as, as I think Decidim were called. But it's not something that all the projects and free software projects uh, have, have that advantage. So today we have Adriana Gro from uh, the, the German Sovereign Tech Fund new Sovereign Tech Fund, which is a fund set up um, for supporting free technologies, and she's going to say much more about it than I am, <laughs> and she'll speak uh, for, uh, not just about the, the Tech Fund, but about sustainability uh, of free technologies, and that'll be for about 20 minutes, yeah? And then we'll have a, a conversation and then uh, obviously invite the floor and Fila Cero to come and, come and join us and to speak. Adriana, over to you. Thank you very much, Malcolm. Uh, thank you for having me for the invitation. Really happy to be here. Um, unfortunately, uh, only speak English and German, but hola, nice to meet you. Um, I'll start as set with my presentation and then I'm really happy to go into a discussion. And here come my slides. So let me stand up here. Maybe to give you a little bit of a backstory where I come from, um, because this is a nice transition into what I want to talk about today. I studied political sciences, so I think about society and politics and how we can, in general, do things better than we did them before. So this is where I come from. I'm not a technologist. I don't actually care about technology, <laughs> but I care about you know, the problems that we have as society, the goals that we have, what we aspire to do, what we want our future to look like. And as it happens, when I graduated um, with a focus on democratic innovations in, I think, 2016, we just recently saw um, Brexit and Trump got elected, so I didn't feel like I should work for, I don't know, a consultancy in Brussels or join the office of any MEP, but maybe think about, okay, what could I do personally with a group of other people to make things better? And I think lots of people felt that way back in 2016. Uh, we saw a couple of new movements, a couple of new uh, political parties. And as it happened in my case, uh, I developed an app. <laughs> maybe that's 
a thing that people do in my generation, I don't know. It was a fun little idea, it worked out pretty well. We did it in a, for the general elections in 2017 and in 2021 again in Germany. So it was like a classical civic tech little uh, application and that was fun but it brought me to the question to think on a broader scale how could we use technology as a tool set to solve, not solve, but to tackle some of the problems that we have. So we map out the problems and then we look at some or, or more points where could we apply technology. And that led me to the Prototype Fund. Some might have heard about this before, it's by the Open Knowledge Foundation. Uh, I led the fund until uh, last year uh, where we invested um, about one million a year in civic tech projects um, with public money from the German government. However, doing that led me to the next question, which uh, is kind of uh, summarized broadly in the title of my presentation today, uh, the open source ecosystem, digital infrastructure, sustainability, and digital sovereignty. I have a quick look. Okay, I'm not too fast for the translation. And this little... Uh, XKCD comic is basically my whole presentation for today. You're welcome. Um, it is also, it wasn't that easy, but basically what uh, convinced the German government to set up a new fund targeting digital infrastructures and sustainability. Uh, I hope everyone can see it. I, I can describe it a little, a little bit. So you see all those little um, blocks stacked upon each other. And then you see a couple of really massive blocks at the bottom and then at the far right corner there is this one little stick. And this one little stick is that one person somewhere working on some open source component forever and nobody ever thanked them or supported them or gave them any kind of financial benefit for that. And this is what our um, ecosystem, our open source infrastructure ecosystem, which is our modern internet, looks like uh, right now. And that's not sustainable. So the issue isn't that this is open source or that people work in their free time on open source maintenance. That's not a problem. That is actually why the internet looks like it looks like today. And this is why open source software is the most successful software tactic of present times. Because people who are really good in what they're doing, just do it. And then they offer it to everyone to reuse it for whatever they want to do. And this is great, and we don't want to change this, but we don't want it to look like that forever, because it's not fair to the people who, oh, I need to point here, who are volunteers, and it's not um, working out if there is an imbalance in the whole open source ecosystem. And with imbalance, I mean that way more people use open source software or kind of use it for their financial gain, but not commit back to it. And previously on, there wasn't such a great imbalance. You had roughly the same amount of people contributing and using. And right now, because open source software is so successful and has such great quality and is used everywhere, we have an imbalance here. And this is when I started thinking about, okay, maybe we don't only need prototyping, we shouldn't always focus on innovation. Innovation is great. Uh, I used to run an innovation fund. But if you just focus on that, you're missing out, maybe, you know, or let's say it like this, it's two sides of the same coin. You can't have great innovation without solid and safe infrastructure. And if you only have great infrastructure but no innovation, it won't get you far. But right now we see that every new program is like, okay, what new great thing can we do? But we should focus on what can we maybe maintain that is already there? Like look at what we got and not what we don't want, uh, don't have yet. Um, and also, Speaking a little bit more about the economical side of things, um, of course your startup ecosystem and your small and medium sized enterprises, they also rely on that because everyone is using open source software, it's, it's as I said, qu great quality, it's saving time if you don't have to do everything from scratch, everyone does that and that's, as I said, a great thing. So, diving deeper. No, it doesn't. There it goes. Uh, a little bit deeper into what we're actually talking about. 
uh, when I say so, um, digital infrastructure or software infrastructure, it's beautiful because every time I ask somebody else, what do you think that means, I have a slightly different answer. And I think all of those answers are correct. Um, but this is the reason why it's so important to make it really precise about what I'm talking right now. Because infrastructure has many layers and totally different things can be understood as infrastructure. Right here I'm talking about, I say, like building blocks or really stuff like software developers need to develop software. That is what I mean right now when I speak about infrastructure. So libraries, languages, frameworks, and those things are often also where when uh, a bug is um, exploited, it scales in the most negative way through the whole stack. So this needs to be safe and solid and maintained well in order for our whole internet ecosystem to function properly. There's a lot of text on the slide. Um, maybe now is a good uh, um, point to say that if you want to have the slides, I'm happy to share them afterwards because you probably won't be uh, able to read all of this. So, okay, this is what I mean with digital infrastructure. Why is this important? I've been talking about this the whole time right now, but maybe stress it once again. Everything relies on it. Our whole modern society runs on software, and that means it runs on digital infrastructures. Um, the uh, European Commission had a DG Connect study that also, to give you some numbers, I mean, this is not the most important thing, especially talking about democracy, but it helps to convince people that this is important. They uh, had a study where it says the cost-benefit ratio in investing in open source software and digital infrastructures is one to four. So you get four times the amount back from your initial investment, and usually you invest in stuff that you know, helps a variety of groups of people and not just companies. Because you, this is the beautiful thing about infrastructure, it's not just for one set of people or institutions, it is used all across um, the board. Uh, and also it is uh, growing in its financial uh, impact in the European Union. So if somebody's not listening to all the great qualities of open source software when it comes to openness, accountability, security, transparency and so on, you can throw that, those numbers at them and then maybe that they are convinced. So it is pretty important. And here are some more beautiful numbers for you to look at and convince people if they don't believe it. Uh, in the economical sense, uh, of course, GitHub plays a major role here. Uh, I think I'm going to skip this for timekeeping and look at the challenges directly. Um, so remember the little comic about how this is not sustainable? There is a misconception that this is not a problem. Like open source software is just here. There are some people, we don't know them, they do it in their free time because they want to. This is going to be like, it's always going to be like that. And we don't need to do actually anything about it. Um, there's also a lack of cultural understanding. Sometimes I would even say there's a like a translation problem, like the people who need to understand why this is important and why we need to invest in sustainability and digital infrastructures speak sometimes kind of a different language than the people who actually work in that field. And I feel like we need translators helping one side and the other side to really actually communi com uh, communicate with each other. Um, also, money is a contested topic. Um, money, first and foremost, I'm going to say this later on, but I'm going to say it right now, money doesn't solve the problems alone or at all. Money can be a tool actually to tackle some of the problems and it can help to make some things better, but it unfortunately doesn't work like just take some money, throw it at them and then it's going to be good. So this is, this is not the thing. Also money isn't what motivates many communi communities that work in that field. So money is not spoken of and it's not, not something that people want to think about generally. 
And then also comparing it to uh, infrastructure as in roads and bridges. I mentioned the report on the previous slide, if you haven't read it, Roads and Bridges by Nadia Ekbal from 2016 is still a great read. I can highly uh, encourage looking into it. It's also an easy and f fun read. Somebody might not expect that from digital infrastructure, but uh, it is really nice. Um, the difference between roads and bridges and digital infrastructure is that we sometimes don't even know something is infrastructure when it is being built. It becomes infrastructure because it's widely used then, or it becomes very critical for um, some fields. So sometimes it's hard, you know, you imagine you're a software developer and you have this nice little amazing tool and you offer it and then millions of people use it for their software products and services and suddenly you become an infrastructure maintainer. And uh, that's tough. <laughs> I, I don't wish it upon anyone. <laughs> Um, because if you don't deliver, people are going to be really mad at you, but they're never going to give you any money for doing it. So maybe you don't even want the money, but nevertheless. So this is, this is the reason why it is challenging. We could talk uh, at least 15 minutes about each and every point. We can do that uh, at another time. And if we don't find a solution to uh, tackle those problems, they will grow in size and serenity. So the challenges that arise here uh, are security weaknesses. Um, you see 75% of audited uh, code bases already have them. Um, then you, we have 64% of projects on GitHub that are only maintained by just one or two people. Like, as I said, they just did something. It's great. Suddenly, they need to take care of it forever. Um, and then some of them just say, like, I'm going to not do that. I'm going to vanish. And so we have 91% of analyzed code bases. This is a report from Brazil, by the way, um, that are actually not maintained. So, but they are still used in other software products. But nobody looks at them anymore. Dangerous. Uh, we actually, I think, need more numbers here to throw them at people, to stress what we need to do and that we need to do something. And we need to answer a couple of more questions. Um, questions, and we have them in our discussion, I think, um, later on, about governance, uh, about um, diversity and uh, sustainability, as in how do we bring more people into this field? Like maintenance work, to be honest, is not sexy. It's not, look at this cr crazy new tool that I developed and everyone's going to be like, yay, I want this. It's like, look at this one software component that I maintain since 10 years and everyone's going to be like, okay, great. <laughs> so who do, how do we bring more people in that help maintain our our digital infrastructure and how do we make sure they don't look like who is doing it right now because again sorry even worse than when we talk about um, software development in general especially in infrastructure maintenance we have mostly white men with a higher education because you need to have a lot of privilege to be able to maintain software in your free time um, like not maybe doing a lot of care work or whatever. So, challenges. Uh, pretty pretty uh, severe, I would say. We have people thinking about solutions, and uh, that is great, to bring more sustainability and diversity and so on into the field. Um, there is crowdfunding. There was even VC funding in um, uh, open source software platforms. Um, then there's sponsorship models. Again, here I say, though, money isn't the problem per se, and money won't solve it alone. And then you have some ideas of public funding to help um, maintain and improve the open source software ecosystem. Uh, you have the Open Technology Fund in the US, and you have NLNet in the Netherlands. No, they are based, I think, in Brussels. And they do a great job, um, but maybe some have heard that, for example, OTF got under attack in the very final month of the Trump presidency, and they were shut down. And you could actually feel it all around the globe in, like, 
amazing projects um, that help to circumvent uh, internet shutdowns, that help to ensure free speech in, in uh, authoritarian uh, countries and regions, they had no funding anymore because OTF couldn't give it to them any, any longer. So this is when uh, a couple of people and uh, myself, we thought about, okay, well, maybe public funding could be a great uh, mechanism to increase sustainability in the digital infrastructure field if we get more governments to do it. And here the idea is not that companies should not invest in digital infrastructures because some of them already do it, especially larger companies. And it's also not the idea to push out the volunteers. If the volunteers wouldn't be here, we would have major trouble right now. So we, we need to thank them every day for their work. But the idea is to bring in another actor as the public, uh, as the government, to support this. So we have this triangulation in the field that might help to increase overall sustainability um, and how well things work here. And now I'm going to speed up a little. I haven't seen my sign yet that I have only a couple of minutes left, but I think it'd be great if we don't talk for any longer. I'll give you a little rundown of the Sovereign Tech Fund, because as mentioned, this is what I'm doing right now. Um, we did a feasibility study in Germany um, with the Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action, where we explored how could a program that sustainably strengthens the open source ecosystem could look like. Uh, we came up with everything that you do in, in that case. It's a mission statement. It's like, who do we target? Um, who, who do we want to support and how could that look like? Um, and we said, okay, we need to focus actually on a very broad variety of, um, of institutions and people because software infrastructure is developed and maintained actually everywhere. It's that one person sitting somewhere thanklessly maintaining something, it's communities, it's public institutions, but it's also companies. So all of them need to be kind of in the mix if you want to sustainably strengthen the field. We um, said we're going to have also a very flexible you know, scheme of how long and how much money we can give to people. And uh, we said we need 10 million a year. Uh, fingers crossed we will have that next year. We started last week, um, so that is still a little bit in the making. And this just, just very briefly is how we imagine it to look like. And why I stress this is because I think in those details, the questions of sustainability can, can be tackled. Uh, we want to go and scout, so we don't expect people to apply at the fund. They can do it, but actually we feel like the people we want to support, they just do their job. And we need to go to them and tell them that we would like to support them, and if they want some money, and not expect people to come to us and apply. Because usually what happens if you do it, uh, if you do it w just via applications, you get all the people who are really good in applying for funding. <laughs> and this is, this is not necessarily the kind of people that you need and want to fund. Sometimes it overlaps, but you know, you need to be, you need to be a little critical in, in that regard. So we want to go to the people and tell them, you do amazing work, this is really important for us as the public, how can we help you and then make it work. This is, the, this is how we understand our job as funders. Uh, by doing that, we would also kind of build up a framework for what is actually digital infrastructure in the public interest. I think we need, we won't have like a definite like absolute definition of this, but we need a little box so we can make it easier for governments to understand, oh, this is our job here. We need to maintain this. And there's a beautiful word in, in German, uh, and I haven't found uh, a good translation for it yet. It's called Daseinsvorsorge. And I think it translates basically as um, basic services for your general existence. So it is healthcare, it's education, it's infrastructure. And the state doesn't do it on itself, all of it, but it kind of sets the rules, or let's say it's an agent. I need to be precise, we have a lawyer here. So it sets the rules, maybe is a little a stretch, but it, it's, it's the state's job to take care of this so the public can rely on it. And we want 
the state, the government, to understand that digital infrastructure in the public interest is exactly that. And they need to find ways how to maintain it, not dominate it, but maintain it so it's just functioning for all of us. That means civil society, that means uh, economy and, and universe, any, anyone. Um, five minutes, there we are. <laughs> so this is how we imagine uh, it to, to kind of run. Um, so we're working on this box where we can put digital infrastructure in and then put the label take care of it, it's in the public's interest, and then we would see um, who would be the best recipient for the funding to actually do the job, because that's not, not going to be the state, that's going to be maybe a community of software developers, maybe it could also be that, that one person, or it could be a company. And here the question of sustainability uh, becomes uh, critical, because sometimes there is only one person that is actually capable of doing the job. But what do you do? If I give that person 100,000 euro, what's going to happen? It's going to help for some time, a little bit, but in a couple of months, it's going to be the same situation as before. You still have that one person maintaining that software component. So we need to think about how we can add strategies to just the funding, community building and community management, governance structures that work for decentralized volunteer communities, or in case of companies, open source strategies, like how can I as a company maintain a digital common? Use open source software for my services so I don't have to do it all, of my like all on my own, but also give back to the community on an eye to eye level and not kind of like let it bleed out by just taking advantage of it. So all of those questions we want to tackle actually by giving people money. This is the easiest part and it's not easy actually because when you do it with public money you have all the bureaucracy but anyway but still it, that's the easy part. Everything else that comes with the money that's the tough part and we're happy to have um, many more conversations about this because there's no one way forward and we, we are, we're excited to learn a little more about this. Um, so this is about the end of the presentation already, I think that works out well. Um, so the goal is to focus for now on supporting the existing digital infrastructure that we have, um, maybe improve it where we need it but maintain it and find sustainability strategies to make the whole field, the whole ecosystem better, whatever that means, you know, more sustainable, more diverse, more open and so on in the next years, or in 10 years time, we look back and we have a better picture than we have it right now. So we're gonna focus um, on resilience, on security, uh, on the technological diversity as well. I think that's important. You know, I, I touched upon diversity, but I meant a different uh, level of diversity, but there's also technological diversity. And of course, because that's actually all that matters on the people behind the code. Um, let me see. Oh yeah, this is the final. This is a good, good slide to end on. Um, maybe I do that right now. You might have wondered why this is called the Sovereign Tech Fund. <laughs> um, digital sovereignty is a very contested term. We used it uh, in, our, um, in our strategy because of two things actually, and I, I, can, I can speak openly about this, because we believe that this is going to be a term for digital politics that's here to stay for some, for some time, and we should all have an interest in framing it in a way that it supports our common interests and goals, and I dive deeper into what I mean with that, and also because this is how we made sure it's understood what we're talking about. Because if you talk about digital infrastructure, which is a very te technical term, and I mentioned many people understand lots of different things when you say it, especially <clears throat> when talking to uh, the, the, the government and administration, it's really tough to actually come to the point where we understand each other. So we use digital sovereignty as our framework or narrative, so to say, and we mean the self-determined use of digital technologies by systems, individuals and governments. So we don't, and I stress this, mean national sovereignty. We need to understand digital sovereignty 
in a completely different way than political science concepts of uh, national sovereignty, because it just doesn't work. There is no such thing as open source made in Germany or made in wherever. There is, however, an, an understanding of sovereignty for us that means openness, interoperability, co-creation, in interdependence, because then in independence is a myth, especially when you talk about technology. You know, everything is connected. But if you have dependencies that you choose and you co-create and you collaborate and you're dependent on each other, then you can act. And this is what we mean with digital sovereignty. The capabilities of individuals and systems to act and make choices and not have singular dependencies on just one or the other. Because no matter which company it is or which government or which country, you don't want this. You want to have a network and not a singular dependency because then you become dependent <laughs> and not ready to act according, according to your own interests. Um, we can discuss this now, I'd say. Yeah. Uh, and I hope uh, my message came across. I hope I wasn't too fast. Thank you very much for listening. Looking forward to the discussion. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Adriana. That was actually um, a lot of topics in, in 20 <laughs> minutes. I think you did a marathon there. Um, and I'm going to be a bit naughty because you said the money's easy bit. And uh, oh. uh, what I'd like to discuss actually is the other bit, the difficult bit. Oh, no. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you seem to have got 10 million something funding available. So the money's easy bit in that sense. Yeah. Um, so so uh, maybe the first topic I, I want to think of, and especially in this context of Decidim, is governance. Uh, and, and one of the most interesting aspects of Decidim as a project is, is its governance. Because looking at op 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 free software open source, for the last, as I say, 40 years. Um, a typical model is either the single developer lost by himself in Nebraska, or in the end of Catalonia in Reus or something. Um, but, um, and then, but the typical one is like a benevolent dictator, like Linux structures mm. or other. The, 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 and then you have committee structures like the Apache Foundation. So you see these different governance structures, which are, you mentioned as a key, well, a key to actually obtaining funding, because you, you say, I'm not going to give you money unless you actually you prove you have a governance structure which can help you be sustainable. What, what's really interesting about the SEDIM is, is that it is really a democratic governance, because it, it uses its own platform for governing its own community, uh, which I think is, is fairly unique uh, in, in the world. I don't know, you guys have probably tell me, I know there are other platforms that do this. But, but um, it's, it's like uh, the old Ameri the, the American constitution, you know, it's technology of the people, for the people, by the people. Um, and and it, that, that dimension of creating a technology, a free technology, uh, which is really democratically uh, governed in that sense, I think, I think it's fairly unique uh, in that sense. So just, just this concept of governance, how, how much emphasis, how important do, would you look at it? Um, uh, well, generally speaking, and actually in the Sovereign Tech Fund. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that you didn't ask me about what governance model is the best. Or no, that, no, 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 I, I, I'm fully aware that I'm a lawyer. I say it depends. <laughs> so, so, yeah, uh, that, that, is, that is great. Um, so it, it, it is the crucial point in everything that we're trying to do. Because if you imagine, when I say the, the money is easy, uh, if you imagine you have those 10 million and then you have a great project and you say, okay, 500,000 we're going to give to them. And then you have to question who is them. And even if there's one person that's going to be like, I'm the one, and you give it to them, what's going to happen next? We know of cases where underfunded critical software projects got money and they didn't spend any of it because they just didn't know how to. Mm -hmm. Like, there was no structure, no concept around it, and sometimes they spend a little bit on merch, <laughs> which is probably not the most critical part. I mean, good, mo good, good merch is great, I love good merch, but um, so this, it's, it's the crucial kind of anchor point for everything, not just for getting the money from A to B and having impact, also for increasing diversity, bringing new people in, how do you do that if you don't have some sort of governance model where somebody is approachable and responsible for some set of actions? Um, 
So when I say we want to think about governance structures, it's, it's, it's not really true because we don't want to think about this. We want to help with the money we can spend the projects themselves, the people behind the projects, to think about this. Because I, I think usually what happens is not that people are like, sometimes that's the case, oh, we don't want to have any kind of governance. No. But you, you have just a certain amount of hours. And you are a software developer, so you're going to use your hours to work on your software project, to do very important work that maybe had, should have been done a year ago, so you're going to focus on this. You're probably not going to sit down and organize a kind of process to find a good governance structure for your project. Yeah. And, and just commenting on that, I'd say it also, you, you, you do say software project run by software developers. And, and again, I'm, the parallel with Dissidium is interesting because Dissidium is not run by software developers. But this is exactly why is, Dissidium so, is great. And you said that people are the most important factor and diversity. Yeah. So obviously I think, yeah. and this is from my experience also looking uh, uh, over the years, is that uh, pro projects that have a diversity of skills yeah. uh, and not just are run by techie uh, yeah. um, who don't have time to do any governance <laughs> and who... Um, is, is absolutely essential. Yep. But actually getting those non-technical people on board is, is very difficult. Yeah. Because uh, obviously they don't necessarily see as much benefit as a software developer who sees her own benefit in producing code for herself or for other people. Uh, this becomes extra hard when you talk about digital infrastructure because this idiom is an attractive project. Like people can understand it and relate to it and they see why this is important and why this is fun and great and impact and so on. Digital infrastructure, which is unfortunately invisible for the most of us, which is one level underneath or even two or three or however you want to describe it, it's even more complicated to steer some enthusiasm for non-technical people because you need all those roles. You need maybe somebody who's good with money, somebody who's good with communication and community. So, yeah. A and here, oh, I don't know what the, the, how, do you, how do you say it in, um, in English, like the cat bites its own tail, you know? It's a fish but that bites its own tail in, in, in Catalonia anyway, at least. Yeah, so <laughs> it's like, okay, so if you don't have the governance, you don't have the people, the diversity of people you need, but if you don't have the diversity of people you need, you don't, you don't have the governance. So you're here, and um, so yeah, we hope that by just paying somebody the time that it's necessary to think about, because this is also something most people don't want to do, we could help them to break out of this circle so in the yeah. future it gets better. It's, it's, I, think, I think that's a very, very important point now, that, that, that um, if, if you are uh, looking at sustainability, uh, it's, it's actually probably a better, uh, that you get more advantage for your money, more back from the money, not investing in software development and lines of code, but investing yeah. in, the, in the meta, yeah. uh, the meta aspects of, of, of software development in the community. Exactly. And are you seeing, um, what kind of motivational factors are, are you seeing in terms of recruiting people, getting them on board, and, and working uh, with open source, either, as you say, interesting, sexy platforms like Dasadim, or very boring in infrastructures? Um, I, I see this because I, I get the feeling, and, and again, this is my, my you know, gray beard and everything, in that over the last 20 years or more, there's been a slightly or significant change in motivation for people working on open source. Uh, and maybe there's an aging, slightly aging population of maintainers of infrastructure projects, and that the younger people working with different you know, non-infrastructure technologies like JavaScript or whatever, Ruby, they not, they're, not, they're not having the motivation to, to work on this. Are you seeing any specific factors that can help in terms of motivation? Um, so, uh, what, one sentence about what you just said. I mean, uh, what I read, uh, and I said I'm not a tech, I'm not a techie, so I'm not in like really close in that field. But many use use it just for their portfolio because you know if you work on open source software, you can showcase that when you apply, mm -hmm. and, and then it's like, okay, great, you worked on that many projects, so you're probably a good software developer, so we're gonna hire you. But this is also not sustainable. This is like flying in, doing something, probably adding more code, which is not always helping. Sometimes you need to maybe even delete code and not add features, and, like always on top, and then leaving. So 
so I mean, different motivations maybe that arose in the last couple of years is you want to get hired and you want to showcase a variety of things you did so you're going to go on github and commit code to open source projects and that's of course not I mean, it's legit, but it's not great. No, and then it's also it's it's another fish that's eating its own. Because if you want to be hired, it's probably because you want to work for a company, and there are not so many companies actually involved in in creating infrastructure. Yeah, absolutely. Because infrastructure has become a, a public good, as you're mentioning, but in, in, in or, and, and and the actual economics of a public good is that it's zero marginal uh, cost and zero marginal return. Yeah. So 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 actually, there's very little money in creating more infrastructure. Now, the, obviously, there's a lot of money in maintaining infrastructure. This is why these large companies who are maintaining the internet, maintaining, well, even software as a service platforms like Amazon, Google, whatever. Yeah. I think there's, I think there's a lot of hiring, which is your motivational factor now, uh, in, in companies that are doing services on, on uh, using this infrastructure. Yeah. Um, so, so, and then that's, that, that leads me actually to another question, is that um, we're no longer seeing uh, technology as, a, as code. We, we no longer actually download. In fact, it's been ages since I last downloaded code. Um, it's for service. So this, this kind of like change in paradigm that we are no longer users of code, but we're users of, of services. And these services are sitting on platforms which are not necessarily democratic, which are sitting on infrastructures which are built by everybody. How, and this is maybe a very difficult question, how do we look at sustainability of code projects, because we, we're looking at building the technologies, when in fact the end user is interested in services not in code? Well, here I think exactly the, the role, and I'm, I'm stuck with my thought for, for the one question previously, I try to add it at the, at the okay, end. Yeah. Um, here actually the, the role of companies comes in, because as I said in the presentation, we need to look at volunteers, at individuals and communities, at companies and at the role of governments if we want to have, re uh, if we want to have real sustainability in the field, in our belief yeah. at the Sovereign Tech Fund. Because um, we need companies to have a, a really good open source strategy, so their services that run on top of code that is maintained by volunteers is also benefiting back the volunteers. And that means <clears throat> not always that they pay them money, but that they ca find some way that works for this specific group of people, for that specific set of code, that it helps them doing what they are doing. And this we often don't see right now. No, and it's, it's actually become more controversial, because if you look at the evolution of Mongo Elastic, which yeah. are providing infrastructure services for, for things, they've actually had to change their license because of yeah. too much free riding from the platforms. As you say, the, the, the in, these intermediate gatekeepers. Yeah. Uh, it's very interesting to see, actually, last week the, the European Community approved even more regulation um, in the Digital Market Act, which is regulating gatekeepers, and the Digital Services Act. But going back, so, so uh, and I, I think it's, it's not positive for the community to see that s uh, important infrastructure technologies like yeah. databases, uh, search, whatever, uh, how, are seeing that, uh, and I don't know if it's purely because they object to free riding of the large platforms or because they have some VC venture capital money coming in who are looking for a greater return. So there's, I think there's different dynamics there. But at least the fact that they've had to go move away from copyleft licenses uh, or permissive Apache licenses to a commons clause, to a you know free for everybody except if you're a platform uh, type of license. That's not open source. That's not free yeah. software anymore. Yeah. So, and I think that's really negative in terms of yeah. are we seeing important blocks of the, the next layer of the technology being abused? and therefore having to change the licenses to actually get that, that return. And if it's not just monetary. Yeah, well, the, the question here, that, that's why I always stress that we need a triangle, is if you see that this is digital infrastructure in the public interest, because it's not just companies or platforms no. that need it, then you offer them a mix of support structures they can use, because you don't want them to only rely on the on, on companies or whatever to help them or to use their code. So if you bring in public money yeah. with the job to, to strengthen, strengthen the digital uh, public's interest in there, um, that could maybe help to counter some of the effects that are right there right now. 
I, I'm going to be provocative. I'm going to say, you want to nationalize the digital infrastructure. Well, 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 well. I said, I we, we, yeah, we, yeah, we had yeah, a whole yeah. range of nationalizing. We talked about renationalizing the water here in Barcelona. But so the it's beautiful, very, very sensitive topic. But the beautiful thing is you can't really nationalize open no, source of software. Course, of course. That's so okay. right now with the Sovereign Tech Fund, we support our initial rounds of projects. And one of them is located in Germany. The rest of them is Sweden, Netherlands, US, all yeah, over the place. When I mean nationalized, I don't mean the nation. I mean, I mean making, making them public. But it's, 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 I think it's very interesting you're saying that the public should support the gap where companies are not actually entering. Or they, or they support the exact, the exact same thing, but they counterbalance it. Because okay. what sometimes happens is that companies pay for developers to do something. But this for once, that, that influences how the software is maybe maintained in the future, how it's kind of like decided wh which direction it goes. And also if the, that company for some reason then decides they're not going to do it any longer, what happens next? So there were also cases where people got hired by one company to work. Yeah, okay. And then the company said, okay, actually we don't need this anymore. And the people were laid off. And then what happened is there was nobody left to do that maintenance work because you killed kind of the community. And the people who did it, they were s sucked okay. away. Yeah. So this is also not great. No, and then I, th I think if we bring in public money and the public interest, that's going to counterbalance some of those effects. And we have more ways to sustainability then. We have the, yeah. th that one way, which is just companies giving back in their own company's interest, which is OK, I think, as one way. It it's necessary for companies. It's the definition of a company. But yeah, then they're giving back to society as well because they're actually contributing to an infrastructure shared by everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but it, they do it in their own interest, which is the company's job, like to do it in the company's interest. And then you have communities. They will do it in their interest. They will do it because, you know, everyone uses it in the community, so everyone's giving back. And this is also sustainable. If it works well, if you have a community that works, that's great. It's not like this is a bad option. This is a great option if it works. But if you then also bring in public money, this is, I think it's more solid in that. Sorry. Okay. Quick question for the thing. Who works for public administration here? Hands up. Who? <laughs> yeah. Uh, who works for a private company? You see? You see the number of them? Yeah. Ah, it's, it's a significant number. Uh, who doesn't work at all? <laughs> Yeah, who's a student, you could say. Okay, but I think this theme is a very interesting mix, and this is what I was saying right at the beginning. You know, amazing uh, expansion of this theme. You know, I remember when I was working 2015, 16, and we were saying, oh, you know, we've got five cities in Catalonia. Where are we going? I don't know, maybe it's 15, 16, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, and then suddenly now we've got 400 installations, we've got projects around the world. And, and I think the mix in the Desidim is, you, you found a good mix. Well done, Anna. A round of applause for Desidim. Uh, in that sense, in sustainability, because it's, 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 it's got what you said. It has public money. It has private companies who are actually supporting and, and contributing. And community. And it, has, it has a social contract, which is something we didn't mention. But uh, I think one of the defining features of, of Desidim as a, as a community, it's not just having governance structure, but it has a social contract, uh, which requires, and I don't know how much to in, enforced, <laughs> people participating to actually contribute uh, in money, kind, time, whatever, to be a member of the community uh, in that sense. And it has a very mixed um, uh, things. And then I, I've worked in other projects for Barcelona, like Sentilo, which is an um, Internet of Things project. Mm. And it has a very different roadmap. It's much more commercial. It's working with device manufacturers for infrastructure, for the smart city infrastructure. Nice. Uh, and it's having totally different governance and sustainability challenges because the dynamics of, of its community is very yeah. different. So when you said, is there a model? Uh, I agree with you, there's no model. There's no model for sustainability and there's no model for, for governance. <laughs> so, and then, yeah. By the way, I'm not moving away from you. I know, I know. I saw, I'm from I the sun. It's too hot, hot for me. For anyway, German. we have the advantage of, of, of the fila cero. So it's, it's great to um, be here with you and I want you to come in. I don't know if you can physically join us, but is there a microphone? Um, to made available for Madis and, and Pedro? In no? the meantime, while well, we m might get a microphone, I can mention that one point that I forgot earlier. Um, I think if we manage to frame digital infrastructure as 
something in the like in the public's interest, yeah. like <coughs> more something that you understand as giving to back to society, as volunteering, contributing. More people would also feel encouraged because many of us have like do volunteer work because they feel like they do something good for their community. And if we if we manage to understand digital infrastructure more in that way, maybe we also encourage more diverse people to come in and because they feel like, oh, this is actually I give something back to my community. I ah, think it's not understood right. in that way just yet. Yeah, volunteering. Anyway, so space for the floor. Can you say, say hi to the people who you are? Hi, everybody. And, 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 a, and a comment you want on, on this. I'm Madish from Madix. I live here in oh, Barcelona. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you. And so thank you very much. Adriana, for your for your speech it was very it was great for me, and you said something I think is very important and a lot of time is not taken into account, which is the maintenance, because a lot of I have applied to many for my project to many funding and always there is this point that what new yeah. something wonderful and the newest idea are you going to develop no and then it happens what you say so uh, I think it's very important and I so related to this I'm asking because you also mentioned that there are a lot of uh, repository that are maintained by one person so how from sovereign from your uh, project how do you evaluate which project uh, deserve um, mm -hmm some funding for the maintenance which not because maybe there is a huge community using that you how do you get this data because if you just look at the commits or the community around that maybe it seems like a project who you know yeah how how can you discover or evaluate this? yeah thank you that that's that's a great question and we are learning here and I'm happy to, sh to share uh, how we want to learn and what we learned so far. So we, we believe that we need to uh, approach this question from, from two angles. One is more qualitative, so we need to have people from the community and the community is very simplified to a variety of different communities, maybe some that are very activist, some that are closer to industry, some that are working with governments to advise us on this. So we, we're going to set up a board of advisors or like ambassadors, we're going to have like a very open uh, channel where we encourage people, please point things out to us because no matter how many people we will be at the fund right now, we're just four but even if we would be 40 people we will never have the full picture of the whole ecosystem so we really rely on people flagging things pointing at things and telling us and then we go there and we approach and we talk and we understand but on top of that we also work on metrics and like a quantitative approach to scan code like github or other code bases to see uh, criticality and how to measure this. So there have been some research projects around this. Um, we don't have like established metrics and like an established uh, tool to do this quantitative approach, but we're going to work on this and then we hope that by the quantitative and the qualitative approach we're going to get quite a good picture of the field. Yeah, there's, um, there's an interesting project called Chaos. Um, yeah. which, which looks at yes. uh, and Greenwell Labs, a Spanish uh, company. Yeah, I think they, we they, have they work on, on the health uh, health of, of open source projects. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. It sounds like you need to, you need to install this idiom and have a participative process for to get to get the the community to actually vote. That's a great idea, hey, guys. Hey, I want the commission. The commission on sale, please. Uh, there. Yeah. No, absolutely. No, ac seriously, actually. Um, and one, what, what was, uh, and one more sentence. And of course, then criti criticality or importance doesn't only mean how many others use it. It can also be maybe just one other, whatever institution set of people uses it. But that is so important that you need to invest into this. So this is what we think so far and learned so far. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. Great. Hi, I'm Pedro. Um, a lot of things to say, but uh, thank you for bringing here this discussion. I feel that uh, we, we are arriving to to the to the point, but we are still very far from it because 
Wait. Yeah, it's working. Um, because why? Because, for example, we are here. We we know each other, and our projects are somehow precarious. I mean. We are working on open source projects and that kind of things that is very cool, but uh, at, at the end we are fighting to uh, pay the people or f get the income to do the project. And so there's very few incentive to do open source and open hardware things, but these studies show us that it's very good for the economy. Not for the democracy, not for the public good, for the economy, for the <laughs> capitalism. Why we are not investing more on that? Why, for example, um, that services of Mongo and so on, uh, they stop it because they say, what is the incentive of bringing the community edition of that? Then it's the state, it's the public good that says, and also the, um, all these bank, national bank structures of the, all these finance that is also using open source should also invest on the critical infrastructure that is software, is libraries, is code, but is also platforms. Because if we end up uh, bringing code to GitHub that belongs to United States, and after that United States bans China or Russia or the country that <laughs> the next Trump is going to ban, then we are also like shooting in, in the in the foot because uh, we don't have uh, also we don't have platforms in Europe. The plat the top ten platforms are in United States uh, or in China in its in in turn market. So then we we could um, try to uh, do our own platforms in a different way and also funding these platforms. So uh, on these projects we are working. Uh, there's code, there's public service, there's there's a lot of things to do and we don't see the money to come and I, I know you're very far because you are trying to convince Germany to do this. But <laughs> we have to convince Europe and from Europe to Spain and to Catalonia <laughs> the bridges are... <laughs> yeah, yeah, well the, the beauty is sometimes if you convince one member state and then Germany is kind of a heavyweight then you can go to the others and be like if they do it the same. <laughs> you you should do it too and uh, the Euro so to be honest we thought like this is this should be on the European level but if you want to do something with the European un Union you might need a little longer <laughs> than when you do it in one member state so that's why we started with Germany also because the, the budget difference in that regard wouldn't have made such a big difference also because of course 10 million is not going to solve any issue with open source ecosystems and so on but you can use that amount of money to do some good and learning how to do better in general and then you can scale and then you can bring it on the European level or whatever other supranational level. Yeah, I, I, I take exception to that actually. My experience is actually that the best most efficient funding is municipal. And yeah. Which is where we are, which where we are here. Sure. I, I, I mean, I've been looking at open source since 2000, and and we've had national projects, we've had roadmaps, we even have regional roadmaps. If I had to generate that, I'm sorry to say it, complete failure. Uh, although they're, they're coming back again, so at last. Um, but the, the, actually, the most interesting and, and uh, projects I've seen that have been funded or partially or wholly from the public are, are municipal projects, which is yeah. the CDM is one of them. Um, Centilo is another. Um, there's there's Lutes in Paris. There's there's a whole lot of other projects. I think it's it's actually to do with the democracy of, of municipals because they are the closest Absolutely. administration to the people. Absolutely. Um, and, and therefore, and this this ties in with the, the, the topic of you know democracy in in technology. Uh, I think it's much easier for municipalities to see what is needed. Um, and to, to, to supply digital services, public open source yep. digital services to their citizens than regional or, well, regional maybe, or, or super na national, super national. Yep. It's true, that, I mean, they may have a slightly narrower vision because they can see what their city needs. But uh, we noticed this in, in, um, in the coalition of cities that we set up with, with Barcelona for, for digital um, sovereignty. Uh, this was Francesca Bria, and, but, but very, very active and super active in artificial intelligence and, and things like that. And, and a lot of the people from New York, from Atlanta, from Hamburg, from, from Amsterdam, they were saying that they were, had more freedom to invest better and to promote 
open technologies um, than, than other le levels of administration. So I think, I think that that route should also be explored. Yeah, uh, so I agree to 100% and still haven't stopped thinking about this though. No. Would disagree in that one regard. Because, so with something like the Prototype Fund, which is meant to help open source communities, civic tech activists and so on, to test ideas and to offer new approaches to how to do things better, how to strengthen democracy and so on. This should be always on like local level because the problems are usually closer to the people, you, can, you yeah. can be more targeted. When it comes to the digital infrastructure maintenance funding, yeah, true. Yeah. I believe we shouldn't break it down in two small buckets because the community and how soft open source software um, infrastructure is maintained is decentralized anyway, yeah. but we shouldn't make it too new, like granular where you get the money. So we should maybe have one big bucket with one very good mechanism that goes out and gives it to the people, or it's easy to approach and not, if I'm a maintainer, so I don't need to see, okay, do I need to apply at the city level or the national or the European? Yeah. But I haven't stopped thinking about this, but this is what I feel like in that one regard. Although I would 100% agree that in most other regards, totally what you say. Yeah. Maris, you're saying something? I, <laughs> I was going to say more, almost the same as her. I mean, I do not totally agree with you because, for example, OTF, which you mentioned, yeah. which, by the way, is after Biden uh, won election, they started working and all yeah, the project yeah. could be stronger, funded. Stronger than before, even. Yeah. So, yeah. but it's not the point, it's not this. I mean, uh, if you like uh, an organization like OTF is totally involved in the community. Yeah. So they really know who are, who is active right now, which project are working, which project, I mean, they are not just reading in their office. No. You meet them in every uh, event, uh, they are really connected. So, I mean, this is for, uh, or under a more local space, I think you, yes, you uh, fund, um, project that solve local problem, as you said, huh? but it doesn't mean that they are better. It's just a different uh, level, a different space for me. One, maybe one last sentence maybe. coming back. Uh, Adriana, to you. just uh, I would like to open the debate. Maybe yeah. we can uh, collect some questions, and after that, because I, th I think that there are a lot of people who wants to contribute. Yeah, love uh, it, love it, absolutely. But if, if you want to point, uh, just out one this. sentence about all the numbers for economy and capitalism. Um, I think the beautiful thing is, though, that if we understand digital infrastructure as uh, something to be to be maintained in the digital in the public interest, or oh God's sake, we invest in a digital common, and we actually maybe granularly kind of move away from this belief that it's always just competition, maybe it's also cooperation. Because it's not going to be that one company that needs to maintain that one stack of open source. It's a, like a set of like, like uh, competitors, but they need to invest into this if they want to maintain their business uh, basis. And I think this could be nice, you know, thinking more about the commons, what that means for digital commons, and how that could a little bit maybe change also how we uh, work and how economy functions, if that is understood more in the future. But also lots of more thinking needed here. Hi. Uh, I'm Ali. Uh, I, I represent Code for Mexico and in extension also Code for All. And I ha we have seen the trend that civic tech is funded less uh, every year. Mm. And we have like done a lot of soul searching there in the community, like why? And we arrived to the conclusion that it is because uh, funders were tired of funding small solutions, solutions that were just good for a year and for a very small location. And when you see it uh, at the level of the Code for All network, that it is global, right? And we just did an exercise. We gathered like the projects that the, uh, the members of the network have been doing, and we realized that a lot of the members are actually trying to solve the 
same mm. problems, no problem. right? So instead of doing like just taking, for example, the CDIM and just install the CDIM, they're building an application yeah. from, from scratch. That's always what happens. Exactly. So, <laughs> so I, I will ask you as a funder, like, what can, like, we're doing soul searching, okay? And we're thinking about governance as well. Uh, what can we do? Uh, to maybe motivate the members uh, or uh, to pitch or, you know, also there's an ego thing, right? They build their ap application and they do not want to, uh, to use somebody else's application, right? So what would you say that we can communicate to the network, right? That this is maybe what you funders are thinking that, so that we can bring civic tech back to, to the spot. Thank you. Thanks. I love uh, Code for All and all the Code for chapters. I used to run Code for Germany for a brief moment. It's it's an amazing community. So thank you for your work. Um, I feel what often is the problem that funders fund projects, not even just new ones, but often new ones. But what most organizations need is core funding, because they need to sit down and think about stuff, yes. and 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 maybe do some very boring work like mapping their whole community and writing down what happened previously on and maybe think about some strategies and not necessarily a project but usually they get money for code for code for all is making a summit and, and then that is funded but yeah no, that's great but yeah i think core funding is the magic trick here because then what happens is you just get a lump sum and you're gonna decide what's best to do with that money and why should it be that way? Because you're the only person who actually knows what's best to do with that money, not the funder. I don't know, I'm not running code for all, you know. But most funders don't do it yet, so I hope we see some change here because yeah, usually funders come with an agenda and I understand it to some extent because they also probably need to report to somebody back and they need to tell them, okay, we're gonna give them one million, what for? But here I feel like funders need to sit down with the recipients of the money and say, okay, this is gonna be core funding, please give me some, not right now, but in the near future, give me a plan for what you're gonna do, but it's gonna be totally up to you to do it. This is, I think, a trust exercise, but I, I'm totally convinced that if we if we work more in that way, um, then it's gonna it's gonna help all of us. Uh, so I have, unfortunately, what I, you're not like I can advise you that this I think is the right right way forward. But I need to talk to other funders because they are in this power position to decide how you're gonna get the money on what terms. But it probably helps if more and more organizations explain it to them as well. Like, you know, the most impact that's going to happen with the money is if we m maybe map out how we can reduce the amount of similar work <coughs> being done all over the place, but strengthening some tool that is already proven to be great and scale it. Like this you? Like yeah, this yeah. dim. That was my side eye. I should have looked that direction. Yeah, Sorry. That, that raises the issue because I mean, I, I think the central government have a, has the advantage of seeing the bigger picture and being a single entity. I think one of the biggest challenges of, of municipal investment is that they 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 they're always dealing with the same problem. So they all have problems of waste management yeah. or c citizen particip participation or schools or whatever. Um, I, th I find it very difficult. Though then they're finding it very difficult to centralize funding. Yeah. Um, to as we said, or, or socialize yeah. funding. So yeah. you don't just socialize code, but you socialize funding, mm. and that's uh, that's a challenge because of public administration, because of tax rules, because of uh, whatever rules. But I think it, it it would be one of the ways forward um, to get sustainable civic civic code is 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 through um, making it easier for different uh, agencies or entities that need. Uh, and have some money, but don't have a money for the whole new project. Yeah. To socialize that and put it in, a, in, a, in together. I don't know how it's here in it's Germany. In Germany, it's it's so tough to make agencies talk to each other. Like they don't talk. They are working for the same boss. Like they're all the city. Yeah. But they don't talk. Um, so here, I feel like funders could also help, as in if they communicate closely, and if they check in about their strategies. 
it could also help to spend the money in a more meaningful way in the whole network. Especially if the funders are users, which is the great advantage of municipalities. Because they're, they're not just handing out money to fund interesting technology projects. Yeah. They're actually <laughs> the first people interested in actually using and having yeah. the benefit yeah. of, that, of that technology. Yeah. Okay. I think we have some other questions. Yeah. Hello, my name is Fabrizio. I'm a sociologist at CNRS in, in France. Uh, I work on DCDM and other things. And thank you for your talk. Um, do you have any kind of reflection or action about uh, another aspect which is very important of digital sovereignty, which is data centers? Three years ago, I interviewed um, Arnau, and of course, I uh, learned that uh, DCDM is using Heroku, which is uh, private, right? And so my question is, do you have some kind of reflection or action in that point because it's very important. Of course, municipalities are very effective on, in using money, but uh, on the municipal level, it's not possible to have uh, data centers, I think. I don't know. Or it's difficult. I don't know if it's clear on my question. I think it's, I think it's clear. I think yeah. Malcolm would be very well... <laughs> well, Arna can answer about what data center they're using now, because I don't know what data center they're, they're still using the same one. Yeah? Yeah? It's... it's no, no, well, I mean, public data centers don't exist. I mean, it's, it's, it's yeah. not a mission. It's not like we could redefine actually what a universal service is. Do you have an answer there actually from Pedro? But I mean, we have water as a public service. We have electricity. We have telephone. We used to have telephone. We don't have internet connection as a universal service. Maybe a data center as a universal service yeah. is an interesting oh, is uh, political project. Is universal service the best translation for Dazen? It for probably them? is. I, I probably. It. It's, universal it's, service. It's I an obli this. obligation for the government to provide as a service. Yeah, perfect. Universal okay. service also sounds okay. like great enough. Yeah. Um, so, 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 but, but the, the, I think the, the more interesting is actually de decentralized data centers where there is a governance pr uh, si um, structure which is democratic, open, transparent, rather than looking for a publicly uh, funded or, or non-private, let's say, non-commercial. I think in, in, a, in an era of decentralization, of technologies, uh, I, I think that element is, is maybe also an element of di digital sovereignty, is not being tied up with a specific data center and their rules and their contracts, mm, mm. but but more a decentralized system. That, that I'll leave with the technical people to, to tell us if that exists or feasible or, or viable in, in economic terms. Maybe you Pedro, you had an answer there, no? Yeah. Yeah, can I reply? Or you had at least. Uh, yes. Yeah, so in in Gifinet. And in all community networks in the world, uh, you, well, the community network is the bottom-up initiative of giving connectivity to people, usually to give internet. So you concentrate all that connections to a place, then to a data center. So in, if you have in, us in your city a community network, then they are paying a renting in the data center, and they and as they are a community, they try to do uh, common pool resource or public, uh, they try to uh, arrange uh, a way to, to be there with other people. And so, so yes, we, we don't have um, public data centers or data centers that uh, from the reign of God and, and so on, but <laughs> we have data centers and specific places are managed this way, and I have a lot of examples, and here in, in Barcelona we do it this way, but when we try to aggregate more, there's a lot of difficulties, the same difficulties as uh, maintaining source code is somehow the same, but in, in, in the physical in this, yeah. space. And Again, very few incentives on it's difficult, so we do what we can, best effort, precarious somehow, nobody can pay it because um, scale economy does it very well. Mm. So go, uh, all these big uh, service providers have their own data centers. Uh, so, so competing against this, uh, yeah. It's tough. Competing, yeah. So, for example, if we talk with Arnau about how feasible it is to uh, host the server in, that in Barcelona, then you see that Barcelona is not enough because you need several locations to do the CDN stuff. So, it's very complex. But uh, then, funding on this regard 
is needed and also coordination because we have different communities in the world. So we have already these data centers. Can you help us fund them so yeah. we can have greater exactly. data centers, greater resources for these kind of communities? So can we bridge all together? Because it's not just code, it's a lot of things related to the infrastructure. So yeah, so we already have it. But if we, if we don't trust on it and so on, then we are going to lose it. And then it will be even difficult to try to uh, put it again on. OK. Thank you, Patricia. It was a nice talk. And thanks for the work you're doing from your organization. I'm, I'm Xavier, a member of the, the CDIM Association and the community. And uh, we, I think we, we're facing a, a pretty serious challenge of sustainability in the midterm. Uh, and I was surprised to know that, surprisingly, money is not the problem, because we, it is a big problem for, for the CDIM. <laughs> um, and and the, I mean, in fact, the, 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 the companies that are provide services with the CDIM contribute not, no money right now to the association uh, and, and very little code in terms of the long-term sustainability. Uh, and the public institutions uh, apparently have uh, serious problems on providing mid and long-term uh, money uh, unless they own the association, unless they are a part of the association, which will automatically break the, the democratic quality of it, paradoxically, because uh, the democratic basis of the CDIM is an international distributed project, and local governments are local, and, uh, and it's difficult to, to balance the, the democratic quality of their ownership of the, of the association, right? So I'm curious to know how do you bring money into your organization, because it seems like there is no legal channel in which the city could get public funding right now. And uh, since, uh, sadly, I think we, we are not going to get any of your 10 million money because we're not deep enough into the uh, stack or we're not lonely Thailandese uh, <laughs> uh, programmers. Yeah. How, maybe, can we get any German money? How, I mean, yeah, you could get definitely well, that's German good. money. But what is, what is the legal channel for it? I'm just no, curious no, no, to it's know, a, it's technically. A, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. And also, uh, sorry, I didn't make myself clear enough. Money isn't a problem often for infrastructure components because there's often no product value in this it's it's like it's one tiny little part that uh, is very deep down so if there's a problem it's going to scale through the whole system but it's it's nothing somebody sells whereas products that have democratic value first and foremost and not business value first and foremost, we often see that it's super hard for them at a certain maturity level to get new money. Because then they're not new anymore, you don't do this whole innovation prototyping funding, you have an established, well-running, great product and nobody's gonna pay for it. And we see this all over the place. And we also saw this with the prototype fund where we did only prototype funding and then people were like, okay, this is super, but now we're a prototype and what happens next and usually the answer is nothing um, so that is super bad um, so there was another discussion in Germany when we were working on the concept for the sovereign tech fund to have something like a foundation for uh, scaling great civic tech projects and this debate is still on the table but it hasn't moved forward much and we focused on funding infrastructure first now um, because we believe in uh, improvement by small steps and so we also look at okay where, where, where can we have our next win in this massive field of challenges and the infrastructure fund was a logical and approachable next thing, so that's why we did it. That doesn't mean I don't see that problem, I see it very much, and I uh, think it might even be a little more tricky than the infrastructure funding. Um, not in the actual doing of the funding, but in how you sell it. To say, I mean, this is very bland, but you also, you always need to have some narrative around it. And here our narrative is how can we uh, define digital infrastructure as a digital public good that needs to be paid for with public money in the public's interest. That's kind of straightforward. We, we talk about digital sovereignty in that regard. It's understood on a political level. 
the question how to invest sustainably and who is that, who should do that, how it's going to look in 10 years time in digital software tools that help us to improve our workings as society is even more complicated. Should the state always pay for, for example, Decidim forever? Should you be like all paid? So should you be bureaucrats? Should you be pay paid by local government or state government? It's, it's actually really tricky. I don't have like a, a, a complete answer here. And I think probably it's going to be a mix again of people. I think it should also not just be name whoever. I'm going to name Google because they invested a lot in civic tech communities for some time. I don't know if they still do it. It should also not just be them, but maybe it also should be them. I don't have an, a complete answer here. And I think it's even trickier than what we're trying to do with the sovereign tech yeah. fund. So I give you that. <laughs> yeah, I'd agree that in public projects, because if you compare with the private sector where you have the two main kind of like organizational um, tools for, for sustainability is either uh, a, a through a company, because you can channel money and, and interest through a company, or through a foundation. Mm. And, and, and actually the, the most sustainable free software projects are probably the foundation ones. So looking at Apache, looking at Mozilla, looking yeah. at Linux, yeah. looking at, I mean, obviously they do have their independent life and Linux was massively sustainable before the Linux Foundation was created. But since then it's more stable and stronger. It's got more, more, yeah. more resilience. Yeah. So I don't, I don't think that the, the, the public or the civic technology, that there, are, there are, I think, foundations for civic. I think Sahana in the States, there's various foundations looking at supporting um, civic technologies in, in yeah. that sense. Uh, but again, the US has this approach, which is much more private, private, public private. Yeah. So, so that, that there's an easier movement in, in that sense. I think in Europe, certainly my experience with, with public sector money in, in Spain, um, moving money into a foundation, even an association, uh, for general public interest is really difficult. Yeah. Yeah, yeah um, that's exactly. And, yeah. and and I think that, that the, the 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 mixed nature of like dissident community uh, requires a mixed answer. Yeah. Uh, and and that's difficult to find. Uh, I very much agree with it. The next the midterm is 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 very much an, uh, a target to be aimed at. No. Uh, the, the, the idea in Germany was also a foundation, but yeah. then you run into all the detailed questions, like what money goes in. How well, yeah, but and then you got, you got this idea that it's bidding. You have to have some form of tender. Yeah. So you have to have a tender who wants this amount of money, and that, which is fine, which is a competitive way or democratic way of getting people to request. But then you say you get the people who know how to do a tender, not the essential projects, which are so that, that so then you get you know questions about can the state fund private projects uh, the and the competition issues. So uh, I would like to just, just to add something important. Uh, we know that there is no answer, no one answer. There are multiple answers, but definitely we are here discussing that because we need to find collectively a reflection about that because it's a challenge, not only for our project, uh, it's a challenge for the all open source ecosystem. Uh, and actually we had this discussion four years ago when we we have a two years process discussing about the model of governance and which was the the legal uh, the legal framework to organize the, the the community and actually we still there because we create the association we create the the channels to cooperate between the public institution and the, and the association but we find limits why because for a city council it's so easy if we have the money definitely uh, to invest in new uh, uh, new needs of the project, new features, uh, new new things that we need, new new things that we need as a city. But it's very difficult to justify as a public uh, spend um, the maintenance of the core. Definitely, the, the the problem how we can ensure that a global project uh, has the maintenance, and this is why we create uh, the association. Not not just to keep alive the core, to keep alive the core and all the community and all the values, mm. democra democratic values of the community. Um, the question is how, uh, if you create a, a legal infrastructure like this, how you can get public money to uh, spread to different open source projects, but also um, because w we as a public institution would know how we can push to other public institutions to do that. Because from the city council we are doing, and I really believe that we could do it more, but uh, we are investing a lot of money in new developments, but we cannot 
uh, invest in in the mountains of the of the the huge thing because uh, I don't know every how many contributions we have every week we have uh, tens of contributions that all the developers that are here knows about that and we have a problem of, of scalability mm. and we can invest doing public procurements we can invest on improve the software but we are stressing the core because we are investing in create new things but we are not creating the conditions to ensure that the core is uh, has the capacity to absorb uh, this this grow uh, I think that we can find a way to uh, facilitate the public institutions to uh, to put money in this kind of projects. Uh, actually, now uh, in the in the national government, we are how they are wasting daily millions and millions and thousands of millions of euros coming from the next, gener next generation funds going to technology and. Are any one of these money is going to uh, open source project. But we are talking not about 10 millions, we are talking about 200,000 millions. This is the number. And this is money that we are like definitely losing uh, as a window of opportunity to, uh, to, uh, to feed the, the open source communities. And just to answer the question of, of Barcelona, actually Barcelona has their own data office uh, and their, their, their own servers and actually the, the, the data centers are based on a, on a free software infrastructure that, that are building and definitely they Lines the, ne the next year, and also here we have uh, maybe one of the most important computers of, of Europe, which is the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, which is based definitely a computer running with free software with Linux, because it's the only way to understand this this kind of technology. I mean that we have these public infrastructures, and all Europe is using this public infrastructure to process data and to understand data and to understand what happened. But the question is how we can uh, commonalize this this commonalize this resources because it's the only way to do that how we can uh, commonalize the resources and also put the effort uh, in the same uh, in the same way that uh, Pedro was talking about the how we can invest in this kind of uh, community initiatives so maybe just one one uh, note to that the French presidency that came after the German presidency to the European Council the German presidency talked about digital sovereignty and the French talked about digital commons and they put out a paper how they understood it and how they want to invest in digital commons as the European Union and they know about our concept they talked to uh, also people from the community and I hope to see that this is going to go into that direction, like understanding um, the, the need to put some of that money in digital commons, which means applications, also infrastructure, open source software communities um, as you know, a future strategy for the European Union, but also, of course, outside of the European Union. Now they just need to put the money where their mouth is. Exactly. Always. We're a couple of final questions, I think, because there's one question at the back as well. The sun's before we all, getting Before we all boil, we're about to boil, so... Uh, <laughs> so, so uh, question, yeah, and then, and then one at the back. Uh, and, uh, and, and I'm about to move as well. I'm getting closer to Adriana here. <laughs> Come on. Maybe we can take the two questions and then you provide answers. Of course, yes. Yeah. We, have, we always have the answers. Right. It's always, it depends. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's okay. Okay, so thank you very much for your contributions. I'll, I'm still remembering that mention that you, you did about how technology doesn't have, is not related about uh, two nations. Like we cannot say that this is a software created by Germany because open source is open, so it's open universally. But definitively, funders somehow relate to some nations. So in our workshop, I organized some years ago around civic technologies. One observation was like, we can find civic technologies all around the world in the, in the uh, global north, but also in the global south. But funders concentrate in the global north. So in the end, these funders uh, in the global north are deciding with software and with digital infrastructure is going to be built and maintained in all the regions and they have a very influential role of the political agenda in the context of civic technology. So my question is how can we prevent uh, these funding models for becoming a, a sort of model of colonialism? Mm -hmm.
you always have to ask the difficult questions, don't you? Uh, your, your presentation yeah. was very interesting. I think it's a very, you listen it? A little bit louder. Uh, your presentation was very uh, interesting. Thanks. You present a, a very interesting initiative. And I want to point uh, more a little philosophical thing, more than uh, a concrete thing. A little louder, please. Si. Uh, Thanks. Yeah, I want just a comment, like a, more of a philosophical than a practical thing, maybe. And it goes back to what Malcolm said before and other people has told, asked before also, is that um, in the past, uh, to talk about um, uh, open source was very easy because people develop soft software and people use software. But as Malcolm said before, nowadays people don't use software. People use most of the time, uh, most of the time means 90% of the time, 95, 98, I don't know. I haven't measured it. Don't use software, use services. Then, uh, th th this go back to my, uh, my initial thing. Uh, you, you are presenting, um, as you said in your presentation, sustainability for the future of democratic technologies. And then uh, what I missed in your presentation was talking about services. Because um, services is the core of the software people are using. Maybe what you can do now is just finance uh, open source code because it's the easiest thing, is the people, the thing that people has more clear in his head, knows what is software. We, we have been talking about open software since uh, 20, 30 years. People knows about open, uh, open source. But uh, service, the concept of service, I think, is not well in the head of most of the people. And then I think it could be interesting as you are initiating a new proposal just to take to try to take into account in your proposal how you can include uh, services in this open uh, and more democratic uh, view of the technology. Because services is open source, or it should be open source at least, uh, this, kind, this kind of um, the more democratic services. But in addition to the open source, it, it should be how we manage the data we are dealing in this source, how we, we manage this service, how we, we co-host these services. I think this uh, holistic view, it will be more, uh, um, I think it will be a plus in your, pro, in your uh, proposal, that is an excellent proposal, and I hope you, go, <laughs> you can uh, go further with it. But I think it should be interesting just to include in some sense this new vision just to try to uh, make uh, the general public uh, be aware that financing uh, these more, we can say, uh, open services, uh, just a way to saying it, should, should be stressed and, and just try to do a, look, a little of pedagogy. In addition to what you are doing, that is excellent, I think it's, it's very interesting. Thanks. <laughs> You want to go first, Andrea? No, no. okay, yeah. Um, maybe just coming back to, to that and then... Um, uh, yeah, thank you. No, you're absolutely right. Also, your question was great about this. Um, we hope that we can start focused and then learn how to do one thing good and then go on to the next thing. So, already learning how to fund mostly developers and make making that in a in a way doing that in a way that we have all those positive effects that I mentioned, not just giving money from A to B, but also looking at diversity and governance structures and sustainability and so on. Um, that is already kind of challenging. So if we if we manage to do that well, then we would move on. And I think uh, your remark is totally right to include other aspects of this whole field. So look at services as well and not just at code. Um, also maybe understanding infrastructure broader than this very narrow sense that I presented today with the libraries and frameworks and so on, but also understanding infrastructure as something like DCDIM, like infrastructure for society that we need to make decisions that we need to, you know, function in, in, in a way that we wish to. Um, and we definitely want to do that, but we believe if we do all of that at once, we most likely either going to fail 
or we're going to make it look good, but actually we're not f doing good. So, so this is why we have this super narrow view, and of course we're li missing out lots of things left and right. But um, I totally take your comment and take it with me. So thank you. I, I'll try and answer Barbara's. I think a uh, question about the co uh, colonialism, uh, as open source as colonialism. I think it, it goes back to what we said: is open source is all about people. Free software is about the people. In fact, the technology is the result, but that's just the people who are there, the brains, the time, the skills, being, being a volunteer. And, and I think the Global South has the problem that it has the people, but does not necessarily has the skills. So it's, it's a skill gap uh, and a time gap. And a, and, and a, uh, so, so I think we're finding that just as we see a lack of diversity in open source generally, because it's male, white, because they, they, have, they have a specific interest, the skills and the time or whatever, uh, in the South it's even worse. So, um, so, so I've seen uh, South projects like Sahana, which was for managing um, disasters. It started in Sri Lanka, and now it's Sri La uh, Sahana Foundations in California. Why? Because there's more money there, there's more people, there's more skills there. Uh, California has disasters as well. So, so but so. Uh, I think it's, it, it goes back to this, the, the, what we're saying here is sustainability. It's actually maybe easier for the Global North to have sustainable free software projects. And it's, it's a bigger challenge for the, for the South. And, for, for our, and, and that's one of the challenges that, that that's, um, uh, maybe scaling to even a supranational, where we should be looking at the ITU, for example, the International Telecommunications, should be looking at this, because they are basically responsible for infrastructures. And why aren't they? Supporting um, the you know the global south and, and more diverse uh, and and projects specifically oriented towards the needs and the, the problems of the south and again it's it's to do with people and motivation and I think if we work on that on our here Catalonia or whatever or, or whoever the city is uh, that that the goodness as you say needs to expand and find these models or, or motivational uh, strategies for other areas as well. So it's a long-term problem, I'm sorry to say. But, but, uh, but uh, I agree, it's, it's, it's an issue, very much an issue. Mm. Thank okay. you. Uh, Adding one sentence here? OK, last uh, just sentence. As individual, uh, uh, three. As, an, as, uh, from, from our individual standpoint, um, it's beautiful with infrastructure. It's easy. Digital infrastructure is easy to sell as something you cannot think about in your national state boundaries. Um, because it's not about a road or a bridge that is built here for here. It's about software that's built wherever for wherever. So um, I, th I think our, our ministry did a good job in understanding, okay, we cannot think about open source made in Germany because we profit from software that is built wherever. So we need to f invest in them wherever. And I think it's our job as funders then to make sure that we're not just looking at the global north. So we need to go out there and search for the people and the projects in other places to make sure it's not a form of digital colonialism. Okay. Thank you very much, Malcolm and Adriana. It has been a pleasure and a Welcome. super good conversation. Thank you.